Lost at Sea. The History of Star Navigation. Granddad, we can see the stars far better away from the lights on the shore. Yes, we can. Can you see that group of seven stars? I know, I know. That's called the plow, or the great bear. If we extend the two stars opposite the handle about five times, we come to the North Pole Star. Well done. It's very helpful for us sailors because it remains motionless throughout the night. It's called Polaris. And if you look at it as the Earth spins, the other stars appear to make a circle around it. But if you look very carefully, you'll realize that it also turns around a central point located less than one degree away from it. What sort of degree? Do you mean temperature? No, it's an angle. But surely an angle is between two sides. There are no sides in space. Imagine cutting the dome of the sky into 360 slices. Each slice represents an angular difference of just one degree in azimuth. That's small. Not that small, really. The apparent size of the sun and moon in the sky is half a degree. We can even cut the degree slices into 60 smaller units that correspond to what is called a minute of arc. Do people really need to be so precise? For a sailor to miscalculate by one degree at sea results in a difference of 60 miles, a little more than 100 kilometers. A hundred kilometers? Wow, that's enough to become lost and end up far away from where you want to go. Which could be very annoying. Since the pole star is not precise enough to locate north, corrections must be made to find exact north. A long time ago, the Greek scientists were very good at geometry. They had worked out from their observations that the Earth could not be a flat disk, but was in fact a round ball. How did they do that if they didn't have rockets? No need. It was enough to look at a boat that was coming over the horizon. At first, you see only the mast and the sails. Then, as the boat approached, you would begin to see the hull that had been hidden by the surface of the sea proof that the Earth is at least curved. Then, when they observed a lunar eclipse, when the Sun, Earth, and Moon are aligned, they saw that the shadow of the Earth on the Moon was always a round shape. It proved that the Earth was shaped like a ball, as is the case for the Sun and the Moon. For them, that shape was a symbol of perfection and harmony. But they didn't know its size. We know that thanks to Eratosthenes, who lived more than 2,200 years ago. He knew that at a place called Syene, now called Aswan, the sun was reflected at the bottom of a well at noon at the time of the summer solstice. It meant that the sun was directly above the well at the zenith. But in Alexandria, he discovered there was a shadow visible on the ground at that same time. The angle that made the shadow was a little more than an angle of 7 degrees away from the vertical. By measuring the angle of the sun's rays at that time, and knowing the distance between the two cities, he deduced the curvature of the Earth and thus the size of it. That's awesome! You can also divide the Earth's circumference into 360 degrees. If we were at Alexandria, we would see the sun seven degrees lower in the sky than at Aswan. That means that Alexandria is seven degrees further north than Aswan. As we travel from the north to the south, we see that the sky changes and we discover new stars. It means that the sky can tell us about our position in relation to the equator. All places where we can see the same stars at the same height are said to be on the same latitude. I learned at school that a latitude of zero corresponds to the equator, and that plus 90 degrees is the North Pole, and minus 90 degrees is the South Pole. Yes, scientists had established that the sun appeared to revolve around us in a period of 24 hours. So, if we were on the same latitude, we would see the sun peak at the same height, but not at the same time. If we are located further east, we see the sun set earlier. If we are located further west, it will set later. 
Well, we could divide the Earth up into sections in the other direction, but this time into 24 hours for the time zones. By knowing the time, we could find our way around the world. Yes, taking the system back one zone in 360 degrees gives one hour every 15 degrees. That's the idea they had, but there was a problem. You had to know the time, but it took centuries to get a reliable system to measure time that could be transported without it going wrong. Water clocks, hourglasses, and pendulum clocks can't work properly if moved. Remember, boats sway all the time. Ah, uh, yes, they just wouldn't work. Grandad, where are we heading now? Towards the south southeast. But how do you know? I can't see the pole star. That's right, we can't see it because of the clouds. But I know the direction because of my compass, which gives me the direction north or south. Hey, the compass just changed direction. Be careful, move the phone away. It could alter the correction that I made to the compass a few days ago. Oops, sorry. I suppose when people use less metal, there are fewer problems. How could navigators of the past find their bearings? If you want, I can tell you the story of the champions of navigation who had made long journeys at sea without any instruments. The Polynesians. Yes, please. Tell me. Imagine that we're not on the Mediterranean, but on the largest ocean in the world. The Pacific? Exactly, the Pacific. This huge ocean was populated more than a thousand years ago. The navigators sailed for thousands of miles in a huge triangle centered on French Polynesia and bounded by Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand. Imagine yourself sitting on this frail pirogue. But it's a catamaran. Almost. The ones we make today are based on the old Polynesian boats. But you said they had no instruments. Did they only navigate by the stars? At night, yes. But during the day, they used an equally important star, the sun. Think about the sun. Even without a compass, you would be able to orientate yourself, wouldn't you? Yeah, the sun rises in the eastern sky, makes an arc across the sky, and then sets in the western sky. That's right, even if it's not exactly east or west, because it varies with the seasons. You can get an idea about where the cardinal points are knowing the date. It gives us another way of finding them. Look, when the sun reaches the highest point in the sky during the day, it shows you the south in front of you. And to your back, you have the north. And that's where the pole star is, right? That's right. Let's wait for the night. Okay. It's dark enough, but the North Pole Star only works in the Northern Hemisphere, and they sailed mainly in the South Pacific. Is there a star like Polaris that marks the South Pole? Well, to answer that, we would need to go to the Southern Hemisphere. Let's go there in a thought experiment. If we go to the equator, all the stars appear to rise and set, but their apparent motion is different. What do you see? They seem to come out of the sea vertically. Exactly. Their journey begins and ends perpendicular to the horizon. By observing that, the Polynesians knew that they were on the equator. Here, you will not see the pole star, or it will be so low in the sky that it will be very difficult to identify. We are now moving south. What is that bright star high up in the sky? That is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. I know that name. Indeed. We also see it from home, but not so high in the sky. Sirius seems to be right above the boat, at the zenith as you say, am I right? Yes, we are at the geographic substellar position of this star, right under Sirius if you prefer. Does it help us know where we are? Kind of. Everyone who is at the same latitude can see this star past the zenith. It is believed that Polynesians used the position of the zenith stars to regain their latitude. 
If, for example, we know that the island where we live is under this star, it will be easy to sail east or west to find our way home. Is it precise enough? By looking at several stars, and the direction where some stars appear to rise and set, they could find their way. They had memorized the position of more than 200 stars and their apparent motion at different latitudes. Incredible! For them, navigation was an art. And what about the star for the South Pole that I asked you about? As you scroll through the sky, you will see that there are no bright stars at the location of the South Celestial Pole. On the other hand, there is a very practical landmark called the Southern Cross, which is found on the Australian flag. Proof that this constellation was very important to the founders of that country. By extending it four times in the direction of the arrow that it seems to draw, you come to the South Celestial Pole. What are you doing? I'm looking at the height of this star on the southern horizon. As the night fades little by little, I can take advantage of this brilliant star as we begin to see the horizon. In the middle of the night, we don't see the horizon that merges with the sky, and therefore, we cannot measure the height of the stars. Like that with your hand? That's not really precise. I know the size that my fingers are held apart at arm's length. My outstretched hand is 23 degrees. You can also tighten your fingers, or use less to get smaller measurements. Of course, it only gives an idea. In order to find a better position, it was necessary to make more sophisticated instruments. Yes, look, with my smartphone, I can see that the star you're pointing at is Altair in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. Yes, but I wasn't talking about these instruments. In the 14th century, Levi Ben Gerson invented what is called the Jacob's Staff. It was adopted by sailors who named it a balistula. It's a simple instrument to make, and of an acceptable accuracy for measuring latitudes. It was used mostly with the sun, but it worked very well on bright stars too. By sliding the hammer, you can find the angle of the star in the sky. By pointing at a star passing by the meridian, and sliding the arm, making the star coincide to the horizon of the sea, you can read on the scale to find the height of the star in the sky. By sliding the arm, you obtain an elevation angle for the star. Then, with a simple calculation, knowing the elevation angle of this star, we can calculate our latitude at sea. It's simply 90 degrees minus the elevation angle of the star plus its declination. So, how do we find the declination of the star? It's written on tables calculated with other instruments that are used on land. Yes, because the boat is moving all the time, so it's hard to stay upright. That's right. To account for the motion of the boat, the navigation quadrant was invented in the middle of the 15th century. A quarter circle marked like a protractor with a weight on a string to mark the height. Just align the two pointers with the star and read the corresponding angle. Well, it sure is easier with that. Yes, but you have to hold it steady, and as a result, it's not always very precise. It was later replaced in the 15th century by the marine astrolabe. An astrolabe? Yes, it's based on a remarkable instrument dating back to the time of Hipparchus in the 2nd century BCE. It was used to identify the height of stars in the sky, but it also served as a watch and a compass. It allowed you to determine the sunrise and sunset times of the stars and to calculate the hours of twilight. Wow, a real antique computer. Yes, it's actually a kind of almanac, but not used very much by navigators. The marine version is simplified, and its hollow shape makes it less sensitive to the wind. By targeting the stars through the alidades, which are well balanced, it allows you to have a finer measurement of the height. It must have taken three people to use it. One to hold it, another to orientate it, and a third to read the value. And by making measurements, many sailors who had looked at the sun at the meridian permanently damaged their eyesight. You have to understand, 
all the measurements we take are tainted with errors. Therefore, the sailors helped with estimations of their position regularly. Estimations? Far from the coast, we can find our position thanks to the stars. But we can estimate which direction we want to go, then draw a line on a map from where we are to the direction we're heading, and calculate where we will be on this line by the end of the day. That's nice. I like drawing with a ruler. First, we need to know two things, direction or heading, and speed. So for heading, you talked about the compass, and for speed? For speed, we use the ship log. Say, a piece of wood that floats and is attached to a rope that is thrown into the sea at the stern. The rope has a series of knots about 15 meters apart and unwinds as the boat moves. You can measure the speed of the boat if you know how fast the knots pass with time. But we need something to measure the time, so what do you think we could use? Hmm, what about the stars? It's a good idea, but not for such a short time. We simply use an hourglass. This is the best way to measure time over a short period. This is how a unit of speed was created, which is called the knot. It is equivalent to one nautical mile per hour, or just over 51 centimeters per second. How fast are we going? About 10 knots. Assuming our speed is constant for three hours, we will be able to draw a line covering 30 miles on the map. It's like my math problems. Of course, to measure three hours of time, we'd need a bigger hourglass. But the more it's used, the sand grains become polished and flow faster. Then, there is also the problem of moisture and movement on the boat. Well, it's never easy. The hourglass could actually advance 15 to 25 minutes a day. As the instruments and the practice of the sailors evolved at the time of great discoveries, little by little, they managed to sail with more precision. Did you say that it was a good idea to count the passing of time with the stars? Yes. In the Northern Hemisphere, there is a way to measure time thanks to the precise movement of the sky. The instrument is called the nocturnal. As the apparent movement of the stars is regular because of the rotation of the Earth, the celestial dome offers a sure timeline. Thanks to the serrated dial, you can read the time by aligning its center with the pole star. The stars of the plow that point to the north are like a hand on a watch marked in 24 hours. Because the Earth orbits around the Sun, a correction must be made according to the date or time of the year. The problem is the accuracy of the reading, which is mediocre. How far off could it be? About 10 minutes. Just think, if you made a mistake at sea by one minute in your measurement of time, it translates to more than 27 kilometers of uncertainty. So, 10 minutes. Just think. That would be 270 kilometers. You're wasting your time calculating it. Imagine three boats docking in America. They find the place interesting, build a fort, then decide to return to their country of origin. By making estimations with uncertainty, the returning boat will arrive, for example, in Portugal. Once they find out where they actually are from the inhabitants, the captain will know that he will have to sail 200 miles south to return to his home port. Yeah, but that's not a big deal, is it? Well, later the captain tries to go back to the people he left behind, but he won't be able to find them. Even if he had discovered a very interesting country, he wouldn't be able to find the exact landing site. Sailors were worried about this problem, so kings started to invest money to make better instruments for tracking at sea. So what was the result? First, they gathered together mathematicians to identify the problems with navigation. And for the instruments? At the end of the 16th century, the Davis Quadrant was invented. 
It allowed for the measurement of latitude with the sun without causing the sailors to go blind. The sun passed through a hole and was projected onto a mark on the instrument. By aligning the moving viewfinder with a landmark on the horizon, you could find the angle of the height of the sun. It allowed the user to gain greater precision, thanks to a reading on a kind of protractor with a larger diameter. But again, it was not enough because it was still missing the longitude. Was this related to the measurement of time? Exactly. Even if there were always one or two degrees of error in latitude, for longitude they had no success. Attempts to measure time by moving the moon to the front of some stars, called lunar distance, could only work effectively if the moon was in the sky and there were competent people on board to do the calculations. Time was really the heart of the problem. Just think, in those days, the masters of the seas possessed the power because it had direct repercussions on the economy. The great kingdoms of the time wanted to have their share of the cake. Once Europeans came to America, it was seen as a land of opportunity to expand their kingdoms. But it would go through technological upheaval. Because nocturnals and hourglasses could not be relied upon, terrestrial observatories and oceanographic institutes flourished in order to make precise measurements. They needed a solution fast. At that time, there were many precise clocks in places such as cathedrals, but they were not transportable. The constant pitching of the boat, humidity, and changes in temperature quickly destroyed their reliability. The English Parliament founded the Longitude Office and offered a reward of £20,000 to anyone who could build a reliable system for positioning at sea. Who won? An Englishman called Harrison who made four chronometers over almost 40 years. Oh, it took a long time to make them. Yes, it did. Harrison lived off the money from the contest that the office paid him in stages after the first chronometer was finished. Finally, sailors at sea could travel knowing the correct time they departed. Did the chronometer ever stop? They had to wind it every so often. Because each country had its ports located at different longitudes, it was necessary to determine a universal reference meridian a line of zero longitude that goes from one pole to another, which would serve as the base longitude. Each country wanted to impose zero meridian through its own territory with a reference observatory. There were the historical meridians of Alexandria, Cadiz, Iron Island, Salamanca, and Paris. But finally, it was the London Observatory of Greenwich which prevailed. Once they had the chronometer for longitude, did they still use the Davis Quadrant for latitude? No, they didn't. During the years of the naval chronometer, there was an English scientist called Robert Hooke. He invented a system to locate the height of the sun above the horizon using an instrument equipped with a movable mirror. A little later, a man called John Hadley improved it and named it the Octant. Why Octant? While the quadrant extended over a quarter of a circle, Hadley only needed an eighth of a circle. Octo means eight. That's where we get the name Octant. The famous Captain Cook had traveled to Australia and New Zealand without the help of these instruments. Three years later, he was asked to return, this time using the Octant and a chronometer. Legend has it that he easily found the same beach in New Zealand where he ended up the first time. Well done, Captain Cook. Yes, indeed. Maybe with just a bit of luck thrown in. It's important to have some of that when you're at sea. A few years later, people used an instrument called the sextant. It made it so larger angles could be measured and was based on the same principle as the octant. It used a telescope equipped with filters that protected the sailor's eyes from the sun, and it also used a precision micrometer. How precise is the sextant? Like, less than one nautical mile? Oh, even better. Experienced operators got it down to one quarter of a nautical mile. By that time, we can say with confidence that science had improved navigation so much that it was going to change the course of history. 
Would it be hard for me to find our position on the Earth? Well, let's see. Do you understand everything that I've told you? That the Celestial Dome is unique for every observer, and that if we were in different parts of the world, we will have a different sky? Yeah, I understood perfectly. Imagine, then, that we are directly under the sun. What could we do? Uh, put a hat on? <laughs> yes, that's right, and sunscreen. I want to talk about what we know about our position if the boat is exactly under the sun. We would be exactly in line with a line that connects the sun with the center of the earth. The line cuts the surface of the sea exactly where we are. So directly under the sun like Eratosthenes? That's right. At this point, we could say that our latitude is the same as the celestial latitude of the sun called declination. Okay, I see, but what about our longitude? It's the same longitude as the sun in Greenwich at that time. And how do we measure that? Should I call Greenwich? No need, especially since in the past they didn't have mobile phones. Also, we're too far away from the coast to have network coverage. No, all you need is a data book called a nautical almanac that tells us what the angle of the sun is at different time intervals from Greenwich. I suppose the problem is that it's very rare to be directly under the sun except for a few places between the tropics. Of course, but let's say that you measure the sun at 5 degrees from the zenith. You can then deduce that you are 5 degrees away from exactly under the sun. Hmm, yes, of course, not that far away. So, your position will be on a whole circle of possible observers who could have calculated this same angle. The radius of this circle corresponds to what is called the co-height of the sun, that is, 90 degrees minus the measured height. Okay, I'm somewhere on the circle, but where exactly? In fact, in a different place, you would see the sun with a different azimuth. But, to make sure, we can use something else in the sky to help us. A star? In daylight, no, it's not possible. When the moon is visible, like it is now, you can use it if you're quick enough. Why must we act quickly? You have to hurry because its height changes in the sky in just a few seconds. The Earth never stops spinning. Even if the moon is not a star, it can be used to find one's bearings. The moon will give us another circle. So, we now have two circles. The second is concentrated where the moon is viewed vertically. We are now sure to be on one of the two intersections of the circles. So a little common sense is enough. If we had got it wrong, we would know it. Anyway, we always have a rough idea of where we are, so the choice is quickly made. The problem is that to draw that precisely, it would take a spherical map of at least 7 meters, where a mile would correspond to a millimeter. In a boat, what we miss is space, as my father said. So, to get out of this problem, we apply the principle of the position line. Since instruments can only help us to know our position by approximations, we only use the sun. And the stars? Uh, observing the stars is romantic, but not very helpful in reality, because it's too complex. The sun will be enough during the day, and we can use estimations during the night. We can use the sun and have an idea of where we are. Then, I can estimate my position, latitude, and longitude. Thanks to a calculator, or the help of your phone that seems to know everything, I can calculate where we are located thanks to the position of the sun. I then have to solve what is called the nautical triangle, an imaginary triangle that would fit between the sun, the zenith, and the pole. I am able to calculate the height and azimuth that correspond to our estimated latitude. Then, I find the height of the sun using the sextant. Because I'm a good sailor, I will find that there is not much difference, and I will write this on my chart. 
I then draw a line in the direction of the azimuth of the sun, which passes by my estimated position. I then draw the tangent of the circle that cuts the line in just one spot, and I can confirm that we are there. We only have to make a few minor corrections in the morning, at noon, and in the afternoon. Thanks to that, we know our position. It doesn't take long, but it's still easier with my smartphone. It tells me right away where I am. How does it do that? Well, these days, our world is continuously monitored by a multitude of satellites orbiting the Earth. A set of them form the Global Positioning System, or GPS, that allows you to locate wherever you are in the world. Each satellite sends a signal that confirms its position in space, and the time it sends the signal. And how does that work? The GPS module in your phone just picks up those signals. When it receives the signals from a minimum of four satellites, it is able to calculate its own latitude, longitude, and altitude, and thus can tell you where you are. GPS positioning uses a principle similar to height circles, but in three dimensions. Oh, I get it. Imagine that the phone receives the signal from the first satellite. It knows the timing of the signal, and it knows where it received it. It also knows the duration of the signal's journey. Since the signal travels at the speed of light, we can deduce that we are at a certain distance d from the satellite. In other words, on a sphere of radius d centered on it. Add a second signal from another satellite, and we get an intersection of two spheres. With a third one, we obtain two possible positions, one on the surface of the Earth, and the other completely wrong, either in space or inside the Earth itself. So, if three satellites are enough, why use a fourth one? You remembered the fourth, bravo! For clock synchronization of the GPS, the accuracy of an atomic clock is required. Neither the GPS box nor your phone can reach it. They will, therefore, use the timestamp produced by an atomic clock aboard a fourth satellite three for position, and one for synchronization. A riot of technology hidden under the shell of this little phone. Wow. Uh-oh. The boat's GPS has stopped working. Don't worry. I have my phone. Oh no. The battery's dead. Oh, it doesn't matter. I still have my sextant. 